Welcome to another edition of Expanding Mind. I'm your host, Eric Davis, continuing our conversations about the cultures of consciousness. Just a little uh, housekeeping. It, it seems to be working. My, uh, my near, nearly weekly request for some uh, reviews on iTunes or wherever um, you listen to your podcasts. Uh, I'm trying to get the word out a little bit more, so tell your friends I think we have a special show here, and I'd like more people to tune into it. I did get some uh, mail feedback. Uh, one person, one of the big questions, of course, is how long the show is. Some people love the uh, de- well-defined hour length. Some people uh, want longer, and I'm going to try to square the circle when I, I set up my uh, my pa- Patreon so that I'll be able to have... Uh, additional conversations with people uh, after uh, interviewing them for the full hour. Uh, so you, those will be like extra goodies for the for the faithful. Um, I also got a critical response uh, from uh, uh, someone I've been communicating with a fair amount. He thought that my conversation with uh, Douglas Rushkoff a couple of weeks ago uh, was... Um, uh, he said he, 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 he felt that there was an avoidance rather than an acknowledgement embrace of the key threats to humanity. Uh, and because of that, what could have been an enlightening and necessarily intense conversation <laughs> about that shared dilemma veered into a kind of coded language that was too vague to be truly bracing or mind expanding. And uh, that I took, he went on, he had, he had good reasons for putting his point of view. And I, I've thought about this issue a lot because I, I sometimes listen to people who are inflamed by the urgency of our moment, by the, all of the apocalyptic signs on the, uh, not just even on the horizon, but in our uh, every day and, and the sense of urgency, uh, which kind of pushes beyond the normal protocol of kind of casual conversations or sort of respecting the other person's point of view and, and, and things that are much more temperamentally suited to me. I'm, I'm not a firebrand. I've never been a firebrand. Um, and while I can be faulted for that, and I fault myself to some degree uh, for sometimes not standing up for things that I believe in more intensely because I have a diplomatic, open-minded, conversational kind of mind. Um, I also believe that uh, lots of folks are doing that. Uh, And if you're listening to podcasts, if you're paying attention, then I hope that some of the people you're paying attention to are are very unwavering in their sense of uh, what the issues are, what the biggest problems are, how urgent some of these problems are. Uh, and to my mind, uh, we, you know, we're all part of the ferment. And just because you're not necessarily completely you know, pounding the, the, the table uh, about species extinction or incipient war or surveillance capitalism or the you know, growing nationalism and xenophobia and climate change, and you know, we're all kind of f- unfortunately familiar with this litany. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not passionately invested in certain outcomes and passionately resistant uh, to a lot of uh, contemporary society. It's just that I approach it with a, 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 different, a different strategy, which may or may not be effective in the long run, but I think works for some people uh, and doesn't work uh, for others. But it was a, it, it was a very good um, uh, question. So in any case, also, I just wanted to throw out one more time the uh, uh, voicemail number at PRN, at the Progressive Radio Network, which of course has hosted my show for, for uh, nine years now. Uh, and that number is 862-800-6805, 862-800-6805. So if you want to call and leave a, a message there, that's great. So uh, recently we had a show where we talked to Jason Louve, who, who wrote a wonderful book about John D. Uh, and of course, we, if you're interested in the matter of John D. and really the whole tradition of angel magic and the way that it transforms into 20th century occultism, you have to kind of deal with this fundamental issue of like, who are these guys, these angels, these devils? Uh, is there a difference between them? Are they in us? Are they in the, the structure of the cosmos? Um, and so it kind of brought up this sort of questions that, that Jason and I didn't go into too, too much. We were talking about other matters. Uh, but it was sort of lingering in the air, this kind of ongoing question about how do we think about these others? 
Uh, you know, we started off this year's podcast with a two-parter with, with Diana Pasokla about uh, UFOs and aliens and extraterrestrials. So that's another form of this question about higher intelligence. And then I realized uh, that for a forthcoming show we'll be doing in a couple of weeks um, about the American poet James Merrill's great book, The Changing Light at Sandover, which, which is, uh, is, is made up in a large part of communications that he and his uh, partner received through the Ouija board over a, a decades-long period of time uh, that is very far out, very cosmological, even though he's a very, uh, you know, effete and highbrow poet. But we'll, we'll talk about Merrill later. But in rereading his book, which I had read since my 20s, early 20s, uh, which is astounding. Um, I, once again, uh, one of the major themes is how these this poet and his partner think about these entities who are coming through the Ouija board. Are they real? Are they part of uh, their own minds? There's discussion of collective intelligence. There's discussions of extraterrestrials, of God forms, of devils, of angels. And there's just this whole kind of question of higher intelligence in that form. So these things have all been bubbling around my mind. And and, uh, you know, we talked last year to, to Anthony Blake, um, and we had a wonderful open-ended conversation. He's a, he's a great fan of this kind of open-ended uh, conversation where we proceed with a, a sense of wonder and negative capability rather than a sense of conviction and argument. Um, and he brings this intelligence to bear on uh, through a number of his books, uh, the most recent and probably most in, uh, formidable of which is A Gymnasium of Beliefs. And, you know, believe me, folks, I, I almost always read everything that the person or, you know, the whole book, if I'm talking to someone who wrote a book, uh, I might skim a little bit, you know, move a little fast over certain parts I'm familiar with. But I, it's one of my, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something I'm devoted to as someone interviewing writers. And a lot of interviewers don't do that. And you can tell, and it's dumb. So I'm going to read the book. In this case, I'm being completely open that I have not read this book because I feel like I need to be kind of on a mountaintop uh, with like a daily meditation and yoga practice, eating uh, you know uh, vegan food uh, to to really be able to rec to receive it. It will happen, <laughs> but I'm, that's not going to hold me back uh, because uh, it's such a good uh, time talking to Anthony. Um, that we're going to pluck around some of the same ideas because this book, A Gymnasium of Beliefs in Higher Intelligence, is, in higher intelligence is all about this issue, both our own higher intelligence and the forms that higher intelligence have taken in mythology and in science and uh, in technology. Um, so we're going to dive right in. Anthony, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me again on Expanding Mind. All right, to uh, roll up our sleeves <laughs> <laughs> and dive <laughs> right in. <laughs> yeah, and all those kind of metaphors is quite a formidable, in a way, introduction to um, all of this. Uh, I think I'm going to start with uh, uh, a feeling, a feeling orientation that we have a question like uh, higher intelligence, and uh, first impulse is to make it something very big and, and high and far, <clears throat> so to speak. Uh, you know, we begin to, to speculate. Uh, but I want to try and begin uh, just with uh, ourselves uh, and uh, feelings about ourselves because these so much color our understanding the way we try to make sense of... Uh, higher possibilities or different possibilities. And even though what I'm going to try and do is, is, is going to be done very poorly, I think it's, it's I always think it's, uh, as you know, I think I mentioned it in our last uh, conversation, my English teacher at school got me very enthused about this saying of G.K. Chesterton, that if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> in other words, it's, it's a job that's worth doing how we do it is secondary. You know. Is this the job that's worth doing? <laughs> that's the idea. Uh, had a wonderful English master. Anyway, it's this, and that is, I sit down, I'm here in front of you, and I think, well, where does my mind come from? Uh, where does my seeing come from? Uh, I like to start with these questions, even if I can't answer them. Uh, and to add here a, a reference to my teacher, Bennett, about this, about intelligence, 
he had a remarkable take on it, or an unusual take about it. He said, intelligence is a substance. And when it comes into us, we are intelligent, but if it doesn't come into us, we are not intelligent. Now, this is quite contrary to the usual view, which says, okay, we people are jolly intelligent creatures and go around doing things. And so ideas of higher intelligence are largely a bit of indulgence and a little bit of extra, a bit of a super, a bit of a, bit of a super us. Uh, but he had a different view altogether. He said people uh, are not really intelligent at all. It's just when this substance comes into them. Now, another form of that was in, I'm going away from the immediacy of my experience now, is in uh, uh, the traditional thinking of Giambattista Vico. I've always been impressed by him, as you know, he, he influenced James Joyce a lot. And he always averred that people were not intelligent, Language was intelligent. So in a way, we could start by saying, it's a hypothesis, I'm speaking to you, and people don't ask either, usually. Well, they have some kind of pseudo-scientific explanation. Where does language come from? And they think it's a pseudo-question, but I don't. I think it's very, very important because this language enables us to be intelligent. What does that mean? It enables us because you and I can converse. And at a distance, we can create something, and this is extraordinary, it's only possible through language. So language is a really intelligent part of our conversation, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> no, very much. No, you've already, you've already struck many, many bells uh, in me, and I'm t I think I'll respond with, with two. One, one, to sort of mirror your beginning with uh, our actual situation right now in, in the body, in this moment, in, in my apparent awakeness and ability to converse with you. <laughs> There's all this going on that I, I, of course, have absolutely nothing to do with. And I have no responsibility for the capacity of my eyes to see, of the breathing that's going on, mostly not mm -hmm. to my awareness, uh, mm -hmm. of the, the brightness and freshness of the living moment and how that kind of energizes wow. whatever else I'm, I'm doing. And it, it's actually kind of remarkable because as humans, we have, in that sense, an immediate obvious example of something like, if not higher intelligence, then at least super intelligence, because <laughs> I certainly don't know how to do anything like that. And so we're here immediately, if we pay attention to our experience and what we're responsible for and what we're not responsible for, we already have evidence just in this moment of this extraordinary life process that is so much larger and in some ways much more intelligent than my own you know intellect my own personality my own perception and i just want to mention one idea that came up in, in, in another recent podcast with a permaculturist a visionary permaculturist named delvin sulkinson and he was talking about how how screwed up our ideas about nature are because from his perspective, nature is just like a super advanced technology, far <laughs> beyond our human technology. It's, a, it's incredibly efficient, it's incredibly productive, incredibly creative, it's coming up with new forms. It might move somewhat slowly, but it's, you know, it's an extremely robust piece and we don't usually think about it. We think of it as the background, the past, the old stuff. And now we're like building up higher levels of intelligence moving forward because of our human intellects. But there's a, right there, you just go, wait a second, I'm in this incredible world. I have these incredible capacities. I'm not responsible for any of it. So there's some higher intelligence animating this moment, you know, right, right here and now. Yeah, well, that's, as you said in your remarks at the beginning, it's just so much spins in, in, into the air, sparkles for us. And this is ex extremely important. It's, because there's been this change of attitude towards nature, which is slightly encouraging, uh, I, which I mean that uh, in our developing civilization, you know, for a, a time period, it was treated as almost, um, as a contradiction of words, but inanimate. It was like had no uh, will of its own, its own intelligence, no sentience of its own. And uh, I've often gone back to, you know, to the 17th century where remarkable discoveries were made, like the circulation of blood. How? Through the use of vivisection, you know, operating on living animals. And why was it okay? Because animals didn't have any soul. Uh, and so you could do what you liked with it. And actually, you could do what you liked with nature because it had no soul. 
only we have soul. And, you know, this was extended in that period so that women didn't have souls either. And that attitude still persists in, in some respects. But now we're, it's a, I think it's so pleasing now that at least we can do things like appreciate, you know, actually when scientists began to admit, yes, your dog and cat can actually have emotions. And that was a great breakthrough. It wasn't all that long ago that happened. It's now, true. Now accepting that trees can think and, and all this kind of thing. So we're entering a new phase of communication with nature and, of course, it leads to Gaia. And as you know, Gaia, and then, well, we haven't got time for you to go into the, the background of ideas of the remarkable Russian Vernatsky and his, his, his deep ideas about the nature of intelligence and the biosphere. But I want to just um, stop with uh, an aspect of this nature since you raised it. Because uh, I mean, Gurdjieff had the phrase great nature, and he, he had this you know, very light um, appreciation of great nature as a, some kind of uh, presiding intelligence and so on. But Bennett went further in this, and I'm going to throw it in uh, since you've provoked it in me, and that is he had the idea of what he called unconditioned nature. Uh, you can uh, treat nature and life as, uh, as the, I think you, the reference you made just now, implied as a kind of superior um, computer or, or, or apparatus or something like this, but there's, uh, there's always uh, something behind this, something which was, uh, it's because that you can look at nature as, as something achieved and established, but there's another part of nature which is what is not yet there, mm. which is almost like the vacuum pulling. And you can ask naive questions like, um, what's evolution about? You say evolution is a suction, <laughs> so out, out of the void. It's like, and he had this image, a word from Sufism called La Route. He translated as the unfathomable, and he talked about sucking on the teats of the La Route, this, and it's on the teats of this nothingness, uh, because it's only from nothingness you could get this impelling pull to which would draw evolution out and I suddenly catch it in a moment and I see all these forms drawn out of the surface of the earth, you know, climbing and moving and singing and, and get that sort of thing. So, and the unconditioned nature, and I, I'm putting it in because it's on my mind now about he was connected with his own, what he took his own sacred mission, which was to look at forms of worship which would work in this time and a new sacred image and his new sacred image would be um, the unconditional nature, which has resonances, of course, with Mary and uh, all that uh, resurrection. Yeah. You know, what, what, it, what it makes me think of is, uh, again, just um, in, in with meditation or with, you know, work with consciousness, when you get to a place where you're not doing anymore, and the language machine isn't isn't really coming up very much. Maybe a little burble in the background, like a bubbling brook, but uh, not really engaging the consciousness in in, in, in its crafting. And I and I want to come back to language very much. Uh, it, it, you had introduced it earlier, I hope but so. but to finish this thought, which is less about language, uh, one discovers sometimes um, a kind of freshness that is also nothing or um, pure potential perhaps um, and so that even in the mind even in our own experience we can taste a little bit of that uncondi unconditional mind which is different than unconditional love although it's related I think to that ability to to hold the heart open regardless of any content regardless of reactivity it's very difficult to do but I think also in, in, in mind, uh, we can taste that. But then if we brought, make it broader and we look at it as a part of a cosmological principle, then we, then we get the sense of the, the, the way that the evolution of forms and even you know, all of the habits of nature, all of the, the forms, mm. all of the engineered, constructed, repetitious, evolving processes, this iterative 
weaving that has been going on for for you know millions of years that it's almost like at the front edge of it is something extremely different this unconditioned nature that is open yeah. and potential and we can <laughs> we can resonate with that and my sense is a, one of the ways you approach the issue of higher intelligence is that it has to do with developing the capacity to be within or to to merge with or to encounter that unconditioned nothingness that is also woven into our experience. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I was, I was listening to a reminder, another association, another character, Rudolf Steiner, is he was very attuned to this. He talked about, you know, because they are usual mentation is around will as pushing, you know, so there's a sense of forces and pushing. And he said this this other world, the spiritual world, is about pulling. You're being pulled, you know. And uh, the, our response to that has to be, I found it myself, has to be cultivated. Again, I'm referring to Bennett. Um, I rely on his words and because he was, he brought into words many things, very important things. <clears throat> and his just straightforward acknowledgement of the, was well, not only these two, but you know, there's both the active will and the receptive will. And it's the way the receptive will is far more intelligent, if I might put it that way, than the active will. Because the active will can only start from what you know, so to speak. The receptive will can, it sort of starts with what you don't know, which is very, very interesting. And first of all, people don't, just don't get it, you know. Because uh, you think, you know, people go around and say, well, okay, I've got to be receptive, so what do I do? to be receptive and say, well, look, you don't really do anything, but ridiculous. Do I just sit around and just twiddle my thumbs and be receptive? No, no, but there is a way of doing it and you catch on and it's, it's a kind of art form. So this is the practicality of it. How do you connect it? Because if there is, and this comes back to what I'm going to get into now, you know, something which I really don't want to avoid in this conversation and that's really religion and God and all of that, because there is a, a side of all this discussion about higher intelligence, which is an aspect of panpsychism, so to speak, this, this um, enlarged view of nature, and uh, uh, how to say it, uh, rather than uh, as uh, we were surrounded by this, as you said about the person speaking about uh, nature and its capacities, but there is this too about reaching for why is there uh, a distance as well, so it, between what we take to be ourselves and higher intelligence? Because that's the problem. Why is there this? Why, uh, why does it have to be this distance? Uh, we might get into this uh, for the moment. I just follow the little thread saying, well, <coughs> If there wasn't that distance, then there would be no drama, uh, there would be no point to us at all. <laughs> uh, why is it that, well, let me pause, not pause, but turn to another thing from memory and tradition, that's this old teaching of the great chain of being. Uh, this is the idea, you know, from the lowest to the highest, there must have been a unity, so it's like a chain, you know, connecting the lowest to the highest that we happen to be, according to a place somewhere along this. So inevitably there must be something above us and something beneath us, and we have this chain connecting us. And that was an idea that Bennett revived in his idea of the uh, scale of essence classes of reciprocal feeding which he got from Gurdjieff's in the diagram of everything living, you know, everything's the rocks come into the soil, which goes into the grains, which go into the animals, which goes into people, which then goes into the angels, which goes into the cosmic processes, you know, all that organic view of Gurdjieff and so on. But importantly, it is that a fact of our life, let me put it crudely, is that we are a bit stupid. Now, why is that? <laughs> Yes, why we is that? They are stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the big, it's the big conundrum. And 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 yeah, I just wanted a, a, one thing that that resonated when you when you talked about the difference between the passive will and the active will. This is 
been one of my sort of the conundrums of my practice. This, this the receptive pro- will, not receptive passive. will, receptive, receptive. Yes, thanks for that clarification. Mm-hmm. That's that's all. That makes all the difference. Um, that when one image I have gotten for the receptive will. And, and, and cult, that process of cultivation you talk about, it's a great mm. word because you, you can't make the thing happen. You can't make the, right. the connection happen, mm. but you can sort of build the garden or, or cultivate the, the mind or the, the heart. And for me, the model is like, and you can, you can root this in our, in our own, you know, paleolithic past as nomadic mm-hmm. hunter gatherers you know you imagine people moving across the plains there's lions whatever the band stops and it's nighttime well there's always somebody who's staying up and watching you know there's always going to be a watcher for these early bands and what is the mind of that watcher you know who's not distracted by mm. telephones or the internet or or then they have very whatever you probably don't even have very much elaborate cosmology they just follow the stars they whatever who knows what kind of minds they had but in any case if you're a watcher and you're a good watcher what do you do you are absolutely attentive Mm -hmm. your intelligence is completely wedded to the moment and you're waiting as if something else an entity a being a a, a pattern of a, 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 a creature a god is about to come out of the of the brushes. And that mm-hmm. mind, which is you're holding this empty space of nowness that's just pregnant with possibility, and yet you're not making anything happen, but you're waiting so that when you get that first glimpse, a little eye through the leaves, mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. set, flutter of, of wings, you are there on, at that moment to, to, to receive that and receive that connection. That's oh, sort of... What I hear, uh, receptive will, that, that makes That's me think right. of that. But you know about this, there is a, it's actually a very specific and trained technique in, in, uh, in biological science. Have you ever heard of what's called the naturalist trance? No. Oh, we was looking, at, it really amazed me. It was uh, first raised by people like Tim Bergen, like Lorenz, second of E. Wilson, especially in his book, um, Biophilia, and a very interesting book because, you know, the love of life, and he always, his whole book is about uh, how the love of life is essential for real understanding. But anyway, naturally, it's trance. He actually just, you know, you ought to look at it, you can find it. Looking at because he talks about his own experience, he became an expert in, in um, the ethology of, of ants. That was his speciality, and he would talk about doing and observing it. And these people in applying this, they see things, behavior, and which nobody's ever seen before. And he describes it beautifully, precisely. He said, you're sitting down there in the jungle, you know, and you make a kind of imaginary screen, a square like this, and you concentrate on it. You don't put aside, you know, you just keep, but you keep your knowledge and what you expect, you know, here and so on, and you wait. And his description of it is absolutely stunning because it's like, then, like it begins to unfold before him. But what I like about this school is that they they speak about it in, they, as you can see, they picked up elements from indigenous peoples because they who take drugs to enable them to do that, to remain still and attentive. But Wilson and that the Western school have done it without drugs. And so, to be able to sit still and not go to sleep is quite something. But so it has an ex- explicit discipline in making the the frame. You intend within that frame, you, you have to relax yourself, have a very deep relaxation. So it makes it very, very intentional. So I urge you to follow up on the naturalist trance. Very good, very good. It sounds very, very resonant with what uh, with what I'm describing. But uh, since we're we have a little, little moment here, I do, uh, let's bring back up the the question uh, of language. Um, in the same way that I was saying how our body, just the physiological functioning of our body is already this incredible intelligence that we have nothing to, we have nothing to do with, uh, we're not making it happen, and it's, it's incredibly vital. In the same way, or similar way, 
we as humans can look at language as something that's constituting us. You know, we think, oh, I'm going to express myself through language. Right. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to find myself through language. I'm going to come up with my, if we're writers, especially, we, I'm going to come up with my unique way of using language to express something mm -hmm. new in the world. Okay, sure, that's fine. But another way of looking at it is like without any request, without any choice, each of us, you know, just as we find ourselves in these little baby bodies and pooping and hunger and crying <laughs> and boobs and whatever, and we didn't ask for it, and here we are, just in the same way we're being brought up inside of a particular linguistic universe. And that language is already fully functioning. It's already novelty producing, intelligent, full of echoes and allusions and histories, and we have nothing to do with it. And then it begins to sort of colonize our consciousness. It's within that matrix most of the time that we operate, that we find ourselves, we think about things, we make decisions, and it's all borrowed. It's all already there, and it's going to last past us when we die. Like, is that not another marvelous and slightly creepy example of higher intelligence that we deal with every day, but we don't really acknowledge as such. Oh, yes, as I mentioned Vico, and I want to add just what we're doing now. You see, conversation, conversation, <clears throat> to me, is, is miraculous. It was, uh, there's, you know, this would be helpful, but it's an incident, you know, with, with Mr. Bennett, we were having discussions. So it was great with him because we, we could just, you know, explore ideas and things and experience and very free. And somebody asked a naive question of, oh, Mr. Bennett, you know, I, I refer to something in, how do I know that you can understand it in the same way as me? <clears throat> and he came up with what might seem to be a facile response. He said, <clears throat> that's through conscious energy. Because for him, conscious energy was another of these things which may be coming into people and leave them. But in ordinary life, people assume they are already conscious, they have this energy, and then it says it's not true. It comes in occasionally. But <clears throat> he said the word conscious, consciousness, which I think was first really introduced by John Locke in the 17th century or 18th century. <clears throat> he was the first person to introduce it into English. What it means, consci conscious, is, it means uh, conscience, is uh, to know together. Uh, you know. And so I've taken it, not in the, sometimes it's taken a psychological sense, consciousness is how you, you put your psyche together, you hold your psyche together, but also between us. And so consciousness is in language. Con so that I led to this, Maybe you, you, viewers would take it as viewers' conclusion. The language is essentially conscious <laughs> itself. <laughs> that is, as, as you were applying in your introduction here, that we are conscious and we just pick up these things as tools. You know, I hate this word tool. You know, it's a inert thing I can use because I'm intelligent and it's going to obey my will. No, it's, it's already there ahead of us. And so this... And I go back to then the religious example of the extraordinary emphasis in that period of the Age of Revelation, which was what I call the monotheistic religions in particular, but also involved in Soe Buddha. Uh, Age of Revelation is all about uh, the word, you notice it. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, especially Islam, you get the revelation with you talk just now about, you know, you get into a non verbal state of consciousness, that's true. But the, in that period, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, you know, this kind of thing. This identification of the word with God was actually, a, that was the key revelation, you see what I mean? And it's what you're talking about now, it's a phenomenology. And we can then get uh, puzzled about this, who made it, but one part of who made it, I want to throw in here hastily, I'm afraid, is to do with getting away from because there are sort of top down explanations and spiritual explanations for this, but there's another component which is more organic and natural, and that's because of conversation. You know, it's just this, you know, language grows out of conversation, it grows out of being used. You see, it yeah. doesn't have to be imparted from above, but once something started, it naturally grows. And so 
this is the other side of our human experience for me, Eric. I mean, which is very, it was heartbreaking at the time, this antagonism, disintegration, disruption, xenophobia, and all these things you say about it. But there's also the miracle which is available is that every hand, like talking to you, I mean, we have different views, different eyes, different experiences. I don't know if you, what images in your mind, mind. We're having this conversation. That means we're in the same world. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's miraculous. I mean, people want the miracles. Here it is. No. Wow. <laughs> and that's the receiving organ. <laughs> yeah. Conversation. Very much so. No, I love that idea of the of the emergence uh, of language through human interaction, and then it you know it grows and grows until it's essentially has a life of its own that changes us and we change it and, and there, but there's a relation relationality there and one way of looking at the importance of the logos or the the word in these revealed traditions is that you know for better or worse human beings are still are clearly uh, intimately involved in the evolution of the planet at least in this point in the game and maybe not always to the benefit of the planet but leaving that aside that if the, if we see that happening on a larger scale, then at some point, this in some ways deeply human construct, though not exclusively human, animals have mm -hmm. their own forms of language and things, but, you know, we got mm -hmm. our own twist on it. Uh, it's clearly com complex and, and, and very rich. That at a certain point, the very force of evolution of, of life enters into that field and it becomes lively. It becomes aware and awake. Um, and I think it's really key that distinction you drew between the, the, the resistance to the idea of the, the tool that we come up in this technological society. They That's want right. us to think in terms of the tool. They want us to think of language as a tool like, oh, it, we used it back in the day to coordinate human social behavior so we could da 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 da. And you're like, come on, man. The first, <laughs> the first time we coordinated anything, somebody made a joke. Or they sang a song, or they sang a song together, or they made oh, a right rhythm, on, yeah. or they made right, a dance. You know, <laughs> the play is already in there, and uh, oh. and that's where this whole kind of poetics becomes really important. Like even though poetry is can be seen as sort of a, 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 a an effete, uh, useless side practice. Oh no 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 no! no. <laughs> the poets are the antennae of the antenna of the of the race. Yes. Something's that yeah, was. that was uh, mm. that was Pound said that. Andrew Pound, good yeah. answer. But in spite of being, he was anti-Semitic. But what yes. incredible insights he had. Uh, but uh, okay, we, I'm just looking at the clock now. So I'm I'm really getting anxious, Eric, because we got so much. We could go on for ten hours. At least, and, <laughs> oh my God! Well, we just un we'll enjoy our hour. <laughs> oh, all right. But just I was just looking at some of my old. Um, articles about, I uh, wrote about Bennett and his ideas, and he was a, it's a shifting gear, rather, you know, proponent of what he called demiurgic intelligence. Uh, yeah, what did he mean by that? You know, the word demiurge, is, it goes back to the Greeks. Uh, you can find it in the writings of Plato and Aristotle. And it was, in a way, in a nutshell, I could say the first definition is it was higher intelligence involved in the fabrication of the universe. So it was the maker. Uh, so you can imagine it. Uh, it's a very rough kind of operation, but you've got, it's, you see, that the word angel is, you know, derives from the meaning as messenger, but the demiurge is a worker, and sometimes they even translate it as a worker for the people. Uh, but a worker, and clearly Bennett would attach himself more to the worker being in the work and all this kind of thing is as being productive and active and and doing something but this came into our western civilization culture as as i say the craftsman and it was oh, it's very interesting because in the literature or the story so to speak there was uh, always not always but implicit or around there was embedded in it somehow, this kind of distinction. You see, the demiurge is the creator that he or it works with already existing material. So in tradition, he is represented by the potter. And all the old stories about a potter are really stories about the demiurge because he's the fastener. And, and this is going back to other things we can't go into, how the making of pots was absolutely 
drastically important in human life, you know, because it was re regarded as sacred. It was amazing. But he said, then we got into the age of revelation to with the word and see what happens there. Uh, you start with nothing. And this is incredible part of a change in the in human thought. You know, it's a time people always started with something. So the demiurge was a super being and the, the super craftsman was who made things because they saw people making things. So got, somebody made the universe. Then they said, oh, that's not it. Because who made the material? You know, you've got to go deeper than that. So they came up with this, which is, uh, it is the <coughs> creation out of nothing. And that they became divine. That is the truly divine. This is the truly spiritual. And the religion knows then had this battle about you get into the cross from the demio, she is, is a lesser thing. Then this, and I'm rushing to try to put this in, I'm trying to restrain myself, it'd be nice to be careful about this. <laughs> I, did, I did mention last time too, these, what, all this play between these two forces in which you know, like there is the, the creator in Gnosticism is uh, a tyrant who has enclosed us in his dream. And compassion of God is beyond that. And so the Gnostics have to wake up to the dream world created by the tyrant uh, to encounter the savior or the higher woman, the higher intelligence, you see, and then be free into the compassion. So this is a bit of a meander around this idea of the demiurge, but it's definitely this intermediary stage. And to impose on you a little bit more, I was just refresh my mind that but and in Gurdjieff and in Bennett, I mean, Gurdjieff makes a joke about it in some sense, or the archangels and so on. Uh, but Bennett has a similar view. They, that intelligence can only be concerned with the generality. So, say, in terms of human evolution, if we accept some kind of agency like this, it's only concerned with the evolution, so to speak, of the species and the biosphere. But what belongs properly to religion is beyond that, and it's exemplified by the thing in Matthew, it says, not a sparrow falls, but that the Lord thy God knoweth it. Now that's the infinite God, and it's not the demiurge. Yeah. But, but Bennett still said, we're on this planet in these conditions, in this crisis, and we need the demiurgic intelligence. Right. Well, we certainly seem to have, have minted them. I mean, you know, I'm glad you actually, the, the sort of Gnostic cosmology popped up because it's something that comes up again and again on the podcast. And I know for a mm. lot of my listeners, um, it's a very powerful model. And it's one, one of the reasons it's so powerful is that in, in our sort of contemporary crisis moment, uh, one of the best analogies I think we have for, let's say, the role that corporations play, not only in, you know, uh, organizing the world, but in shaping our minds and our perceptions, the role of uh, artificial, growing role of artificial intelligence, you know, talk about another kind of intelligence and oh, how yes. do we think about these things. So there's, there's definitely a, an archonic dimension or a demiurgic dimension to, to our reality. And yet I, I agree with you in the sen in the same way that, that, you know, uh, short of a, of a civilizational collapse where some people manage to survive and return to the old ways in some manner, that before we get to that point, there's still something about the capacity for a collective engineered intelligence to deal with problems. And I do think that that is, is still a possibility. It's just there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a war of demiurges or a, a struggle, an agon oh. uh, of, uh, of, of demiurges out there. So I think it's, it's, it's quite wonderful you brought, uh, you brought up that. In fact, even that, that very passage I was reading today of, of, about the sparrows um, oh, really? and, and that <laughs> distinction between um, the, 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 the singularity, you know, of the person. And, and I think that's a, a really important part of conversation because if conversation is an actual creative engine a a, a forge of novelty a, a, a an element of an emerging higher mind 
then it then a conversation it's always about these singularities that are engaging these personalities with their own unique histories and so that means that you can't just take the general view because we're not as personalities and as conversationalists we're not just subservient to these larger patterns we are also involved in weaving that higher mind through our own singularity or the engagement of our singularities through language and affect and and emotion so oh god you always set me off i mean just it's kind of like going like I'm, I'm drowning you it's just incredible because i uh, one of the things i want to throw in about this in in your description you know it's, I mean, it's coming up with words we use and so on. It's all part of this. It's not that our words are right or true or anything, but just this, it's, this, is, the, this is the action, this languaging and so on. But what we just mentioned in terms of energies is my calling on Bennett's uh, terminology, you know, different between the creative and the unitive energy, because that's the whole point about the demiurge is creative, but uh, beyond the demiurge is love. And... And Bennett called it more abstractly the unitive energy, but it's very it's a very peculiar properties. And you know, intellectually you could study it, but it's a very, very hard and subtle thing. And you need something like Ibn Arabi to help you uh, to to grasp it because it means this this incredible um, acceptance of of individ, individuality everywhere, where you don't put it into a blob. You know? <laughs> you know? And that's for us impossible. That's why love is impossible, you know. And where it's reflected in human life is usually a degenerate form of it. So there's uh, definitely that. Then, as you were speaking, that's the other thing I wanted to throw in, just an incredible moment. This is a fantasy came into my mind, but I'm just reporting it. So I was looking, there's Eric, me, we're talking. And I said, so, well, Eric could disappear, I could disappear, but the conversation could go on. <laughs> I said, I really felt that, you know. It's because people think the solid thing is Eric and the solid thing is Tony, or we were actually over here. Um, but I think, well, the really solid thing is the conversation. <laughs> and, but this is interesting because I think this is uh, emerging in physics. And uh, just to refer, I don't know if you see the book, but it's quite a useful reference for having information and nature reality. All right, Paul Davies. Paul, you know Paul Davies, of course, lovely chap. But um, I was really struck. I got it just out of, oh, I ought to read it. And I started reading it. And I looked at the end, and there you got an essay at the end by a theologian talking about the body of Christ. And I thought, what the, what the, heck? what? <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> and it's, it's like the, the real, I mean, saying uh, for me, what I call the real spiritual people, in a sense, fighting back in all of this and all this stuff which they've been cowering and protect. You know, we, we're not really like this. We don't really believe in all this stuff about the resurrection and you know, going up into heaven and, and all this stuff. And but thank God, you know, it's like a weird thing without being too stupid about this. All this, the modern physics has come along and provided tools for people to start thinking in that way. Well, or or at least inviting people to to recognize how open ended things are. I mean, if you do, even if you're very very careful, very skeptical, very resistant to the the way that religious thought can come into science, um, and that's a whole relationship we could talk more about another oh, time. Absolutely. But uh, that, it's, nonetheless, it, the physics is so weird now. There's so many enormous unsolved problems. Uh, there's so much uh, sort of tension between different kinds of models that it, you have no choice but to sort of realize that we're, we're, we're still kind of making it up as we go along. And there may be another turn where we come to some sort of unified th field theory, or, but it may not. It may not really work out that way and what it means mm -hmm. to be human and paying attention and using your intelligence <laughs> even in the more uh, everyday sense of the term that's, that's is to recognize right. how open how open ended it is. Yeah, if people you know, if somebody really understands and are intelligent, then they they got it all worked out. They got a system and everything's harmonious and in place. I think below that, you know, that's that's a deception because they're all you know people are still attracted to this top down authoritarian blueprint worked out everything in its place. You know, and that's the sign of authority. And we see the fascist leaders all around the world uh, acting on that basis. But we know 
the real human life, the wet and dirty life, is um, this seemingly chaos, but not chaos, it's life, it's more than life. It's creation all the time. And you're looking at the watch. I'm running out of time here. It's awful. I really want to. <laughs> no, 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 when you talk about it, it makes it worse. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we, yeah, we do. We have like eight minutes. Yeah, I really do believe it because this, you see, this is, this is what we're doing now. You see, what, does it get anywhere? You know, <laughs> all these people getting up, voicing their opinions. What's the point of that? And I think it matters desperately because, you know, it's matters desperately because it's, it's like being in the current. Um, to, I search for metaphors, being, what well, we say, being in the flow in all of that thing. But that's, that, that's the real thing. Uh, and, and you see all the archaic tendencies of, uh, to want to put up dams, you know, to um, get hydroelectric power and those sort of images we get of it. They're using you know, the flow tool. To, yeah, yeah. as a tool. And then we make something and we've got something and it's ours and it's not yours and all that kind of stuff. And so they say, just enjoy the play. You know, where I always say the old fashioned now English sentiment, play up, play up, the game's the thing. You know, now people say, oh no, winning is the thing. You know, we're not interested in the game for itself. You say, no, fuck that. You know. <laughs> I'm totally game, with you. Yeah. Game, like we want to, I want to join a game, so we're trying to find somebody we can play a game. And you say, well, it's a bit irresponsible. But no, I don't think because the game is, I don't know where the word game comes from, gamos, the, uh, it's like a flex. It's like, I don't know, flexing the universe. <laughs> yeah, because the uh, one thing I saw, I feeling I inherited from Bennett was that, you know, existence itself is far more flexible than it looks. <laughs> ah, <laughs> that was one of his ideas? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, I could say, uh, well, it's, to put it in an exaggerated way, you know, reality is up for grabs. Yeah, yeah. No one captures the flag. Uh, and it's an interesting point mm -hmm. when you have that mind frame and, uh, and you see the growth of, of totalitarian thought or I'm right, you're wrong, or, you know, the, the, the certainty, the spread of certainty. And, and, it, mm -hmm. and I have to say it, it is kind of getting worse in some ways. Um, in terms of how people, everybody feels like they have to act like they know what's going on. Like, I mean, ah. I, I was reading something today where, where someone was, 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 was making fun of the news and just how news functions. And one of the things they were saying is like, it's, a, it's extraordinary. You never hear, a, a, you know, a news person go, you know, we, we, I, I, we don't know. It's really confusing. It's very complicated. It's really hard to figure out. I, I just don't really know. You know, exactly. you're like, you never hear that. And politicians, and politicians, they don't even, they could even just do both sides. They don't even have to say, I don't know, because that freaks everybody out. They could just say, well, we could levy this tax uh, and produce more revenue for X and Y. But the problem is, is when you do that, then you also, you know, create this other drag uh, or, or the poor people have to do it. So it's, it's actually kind of a hard decision to make because there's winners and losers, and that's reality, but politicians can't say that. So we're constantly fed this idea that we're supposed to know, that we know what we, that we know, and that you go out there and you combat other people who know what they know. And that's, that's the world. And then there's people like us, and we're like, well, I can't even, I can't even interact with that. You know? And yet it feels like we're doing something by keeping this openness alive by this, oh, this multiplicity, this creativity. It, it, it isn't just two dudes riffing. It's like, it's like making available a space which um, isn't owned by anybody. Beautiful, that's, yes. That's, well, you're just hearing to just uh, there's pictures that you, you think it's not, but it's very precious because everywhere, everything gets possessed and labeled and but. Very true. Very true. This is it. What, uh, what is it to... What did Bennett... What did... Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you please ask me. No, no, I was just going to say what, how, what Bennett had or, or, or what teachings you picked up from him and that, that uh, were practices to help cultivate this... Uh, receptive will, this this mind that's open for the creative moment. What 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 sort of things did you draw from that that were 
you know, things you could pass on or, or practices? Well, the practices are such or practices sort of be transmitted in a corresponding way. There were what we call inner exercises um, of various kinds he had. Uh, these, in a way, these exercises are, uh, what did they provide? Well, it's not quite the right, but they provide tastes. They give you an introduction. Yeah. Uh, but that's, but the other thing is this cultivation of attitude, and it's difficult to put a name on it because it's not, again, it's a bit like tool. You see, what's the technique for doing this? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Not, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not really a technique. It's a cultivation. And it's a weak word. I'm so apologized for it. But it's this, this way of appreciating everything in a different way and having these conversations and so on is, is to do with recognizing that one doesn't know. Uh, it's... it's um, as I told you, I think I may have mentioned it last time, as it was a great moment in my life when I, I uh, joined, joined the School of Ignorance, <laughs> to speak, which was an actual school, and I began to embrace ignorance and see it as a power and, and all the rest of it. So it's to, it's because the way, you know, from Gurdjieff and so on, and Bennett, as this is it's very strange, it's, you be very careful, it is the way of understanding, uh, and techniques are always secondary. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, like your first kind of um, men, uh, words, you know, the beginning of all this about sitting here, sitting there, and, and so on. You see, well, there is uh, an issue which is to do this, which is what you've been hinting all the way to recognize that one doesn't know. And this recognition one doesn't know is actually releases a sort of finer energy. It's not just sitting dumb, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, go, I know, I know, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, it's just, you see, it's the way it's going to be, you see, you don't know. And in seeing you don't know, you begin to move. It's just amazing. It's just, it's just absolutely extraordinary. So, in the way, it's part of the via neg negativa, because it's a very, very big thing. And so you begin to give up. It doesn't sound like much. You give up one's habits of knowing and pretending and putting on a front and playing a role and putting on a mask and blah, 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 and, you know, faving one's face. And you're, you're prepared to be humiliated and embarrassed and all of that. Because that's ultimately, there's very hard moral things he Bennett was on about. He said, this is the way of humiliation. And people say, oh, what? I don't want any of that. <laughs> no. I want to know how to get mind power and so on. But right back, it goes back to one fundamental thing of Gurdjieff, which I think was implicit, but maybe I was praying to you, Eric, you let me speak to you again. Um, this uh, fundamental statement of Gurdjieff, which I get, I read it, I go, what? And I read it again, I go, what? And I read it again, I go, what? Uh, and it's where he said, you know, what you call consciousness is not consciousness, it's not real. Yeah, the real consciousness is what you call the self-consciousness, and he bloody well meant it. You know? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm really glad you came. You left that little gnomic phrase there because that's just going to be the little, the little seed or the grit and the pearl that we'll leave with, with our listeners, and that I'll take on myself. This conundrum: what if consciousness, what we mean by consciousness, is not conscious at all? Just that alone is a, is is a good dig. So, uh, Tony, thanks again for talking to us and expanding mind. It was totally Really fun. Bless you and thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, folks, till next week, keep your minds open. <laughs> <laughs>